Hi, I'm Otto. And I'm Christy. And we are... Talking Dogs. Welcome to episode one, Talking Dogs podcast. Today we're going to be talking about picking the perfect puppy for your lifestyle. So, there's a lot of great, great things to talk about. A lot of people on Facebook and Instagram had a lot of questions and topics they wanted us to cover. So let's get right into it. So how do you know what breed is the best breed to pick for you? I guess actually first I want to I just want to address something. The reason that we're doing this episode first is that so many of the problems that we um, deal with on a regular basis at our, our training and behavioral center um, have to do with a wrong pairing of a dog and an owner. Um, so if we can get the right pairing off, then we don't have problems. Yeah. You know, a lot of people pick a dog because they want a certain color or a certain look, and they really pay little attention to genetics. Right. Or, I mean, I've seen it too where people have, like, gone to the Humane Society or gone to a rescue and they're like, oh, he's so cute, and they fall in love with a dog that's you know, requires two hours of exercise every day, and they have some sort of health issue where they can't even go for a five-minute walk. Yeah, so... A lot of a lot of um, problems could be avoided if we start off with a proper foundation. All right, so let's talk about picking the perfect dog for you. So there's some questions you have to ask yourself, like you know, um, what kind of dog are you looking for? What what kind of dog will best fit your family? Do you live alone? Do you have kids? Do you have a husband? What's your activity level? Do, are you looking for a family pet? Um, are you going to participate in any specific activities like? Agility, hiking, kayaking, hunting, um, sports of any type. Are you a jogger? I know some people really like to jog, and I've seen a couple um, people get dogs and they what we call like road work them, which is jogging or biking them, and it's a breed that's you know highly inappropriate to do that kind of heavy long distance running with. So we have to make sure that we match the right dog up with the owner. In, in those instances when you know the wrong dog is chosen. The dog's joints wear down, and they have, you know, a painful kind of mid to late age life. All right. So there are, um, you know, a handful of reasons you could be looking for a dog, family pet, like we mentioned, agility, hiking, hunting, a protection dog, which is one of those buzzwords that sometimes offends or scares people. Um, And once you narrow down the list of specific activities that you want to engage in with your dog also think about energy level um and then possibly grooming requirements right right exactly like grooming is a that's a lot of work <laughs> you have to, i think i think one of the most important things too is just to be realistic you know what can i actually do how much grooming do i actually want to do or how much can i set, set aside every month you know to spend on grooming for this particular breed um, or if you know if you live on a lake and you have a dog with really really long hair, is that going to be the best fit for your for your life when you have a, a long haired dog constantly bringing in water and mud in the house? You know maybe that's fine for you, but some people may not like that. So, if I'm a relatively active person and I know that I want to engage in obedience competitions and maybe some protection training then that gives me an idea of a list of breeds I could start looking into. And then from that list, I could start to subtract dogs by grooming requirements, by energy level, by do they have an on-off switch? Because if I want a dog that is able to, you know, relax on the couch for a day, if I don't feel like going out and training... I might not want to get a Malinois. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I know for me personally, I like to be able to have a dog that's got enough energy to do a bunch of activities, but if I have a long day at work or I don't have a time to do any kind of vigorous exercise with him, that he's totally cool hanging out on the couch without being destructive or barking or being kind of needy. That's just me personally, though. Otto, what about you? Um, You know, I guess that's really one of the main reasons why I've chosen the particular breed that I've chosen and have gravitated to them for more than 20 years now. The American Pit Bull Terrier, American Staffordshire Terrier is capable of doing all these activities that I like to do, you know, boating, hunting, fishing, biking, um, protection sports, agility, 
dog shows. But on a rainy or snowy day here where we live, they're perfectly fine vegging out on the couch and eating snacks all day. So, now that we've kind of started to get an idea of what the beginning stages of our selection process are going to be, um, you know, based on activities, energy level, grooming requirements, let's start to think about, um, you know, your lifestyle. Can other people interact with the dog? What's its genetic temperament going to be? Um, prone to be like because even within these subcategories that we're going to start to create certain dogs certain breeds of dogs without extreme amounts of knowledge or work are going to be harder to own than others for instance um, we're raising a set of Connie Corso puppies currently and that's a dog that needs a lot of guidance I would say a lot of training a lot of socialization a strong leader. Otherwise, problems can occur. It's actually a breed that's getting pretty popular now. We've been seeing quite a few more of them coming and going. Um, I, I think because they give people a look that they want, and they're somewhat unknown. Yeah. So people can say, oh, I want a dog that looks like a pit bull um, or a big guardian breed looking dog, but they're not on any of those lists yet. Right, right. Yeah, no, they haven't, like, the... the Forbidden dangerous dog list or the insurance list. Although some I've seen I've seen them pop up on a couple, but you know for the most part they are kind of a little bit more rare. Yeah. So. And then a dog like a Russian Overtorker or what would be more commonly known as a Caucasian Mountain Dog, or even a Presa Canario, which is another rare breed of dog, um, is going to take a lot of guidance. You know, this is a dog not for a novice dog owner. I mean, I would even say pet owner in general. I mean, they're just a lot of work. (laughs) Yeah, especially the Caucasian Mountain Dog. For one, the thing can weigh nearly 200 pounds. um, And the genetic temperament that these dogs come out with um, is is not for a newbie. No, no. I I mean, I really think that those dogs are set for, for professionals and for people that need them for particular reasons for what they were bred for. So I guess, you know, you need to look at your lifestyle. Do you travel a lot? Um, Do you work a lot? What are your hours like? Are you going to be able to go home in the afternoon to let the dog out? Um, You know, do you have kids? Are there going to be grandkids coming over to the house? I think that's a really, really big consideration that you need to look at before you pick a dog because some dogs are better with kids than others. And if you're going to have kids, maybe you don't have kids already, there's certain ways that you can raise the puppy to be more tolerant of kids, of the poking and the prodding and the toys falling on them and the goofy noises that they make and all that other thing. Yeah, and certain breeds, um, as long as they have solid genetics, are just more prone to be accepting of that, and certain breeds are not. Like a lot of people would look at a Chesapeake Bay Retriever and think it's just a curly-haired Labrador Retriever, but it's really not. The Chesapeake Bay Retriever is the only retrieving dog that was purposefully bred to be civilly aggressive towards humans because they would work in the bay during the day retrieving fishing nets and such, and then they would guard the boats at night. So the dog does have a guard dog type temperament. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely I think when you narrow down the dogs that you're interested in and the dog's like, okay, hey, you know what, I think this dog has you know, enough energy to fit my jogging requirements if you're a jogger, or hey, you know, I'm a pretty calm and relaxed person, and most of my time is spent on the couch watching Netflix or cooking, you know, I I know a breed that's maybe a little bit more calm and will require less exercise requirements, Um, then you need to start looking at what was the dog originally bred for. Um, When we're looking at original intention, original purpose for what the dog was bred for, it's going to give you an idea of what kind of dog you're going to get. Yeah, that's something that I think a lot of people um, overlook these days is that every breed of dog was originally bred for hundreds or thousands of years with a specific purpose in mind. And this purpose is ingrained into the dog's DNA. Um, Before people knew about training dogs, they just reproduced the dogs that 
did what they wanted them to do naturally. And that's how all these different breeds emerged. Um, so. I think a good example of that is like a husky. Because right. they're a super popular dog amongst a lot of people. But I, I mean, I feel like, it, you know, in our training facility, we get a lot of those dogs that are runners. And. Like, uh, Run away from home. They're destructive in the house. Nobody's out with a team of them mushing. Right. I mean, that's what they were bred to do for hundreds and hundreds of years. And now we've taken that kind of purpose or their job away, and we want them to just hang out in the house and not do anything. It's a little counterproductive to their genetics. One of my favorite questions to ask clients, and maybe this is like a good question to ask yourself too, is what's your favorite activity? Like let's say maybe it's yoga or painting or, um, I don't know, lifting weights. Now think about never being able to do that activity again, never again. Could you imagine you might get a little frustrated, you might act out, you know, you might act out of sorts. It's the same thing with the dogs. When you take what they love, what they're bred for, what their genetics tell them is the thing to do, and we deny them the opportunity um, to do those things or do an activity that mimics those things, you have a dog that's going to create a lot of problems for you. Yeah, um... A big part of our program and creating balance in dogs is what we call genetic fulfillment. And um, I recently helped my older brother acquire a very nicely bred um, German Shepherd dog. And he grew up in the same house I grew up in where we had five German Shepherds in the house. But he didn't really get the dog gene. So I immediately put him in contact with a colleague in his area to make sure that he was taught about genetic fulfillment because having a high performance bred dog and then not providing genetic fulfillment is like owning a Ferrari and only driving it 20 miles an hour. Yeah, it's 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 like a it's it's a waste of the dog and you're not really fully using the dog and the dog's really never fully going to be happy. Um something else I think is really important to consider and this is something we also see pretty frequently at work is older people and I would say you know 55 65 plus that go out and get a puppy that's really high drive or really high energy. Um, you know, I think we need to be really realistic about what we can handle, what our physical strengths are, you know, at different ages of our, of our life. Um, the, the, the reason I say this is we've had more than one of these clients come back to us and they've fallen on the walk, they've broken something. Yeah. And Been nothing, knocked over just yeah. because of the energy level of the dog, hyper energy. And not that the dog had any bad intentions or really extremely inappropriate behavior for a puppy. Yeah, it's not a bad dog. It's just so powerful that their physical ability did not match this dog. Right, and then the people get hurt. And then we get the phone calls, hey, we don't know what to do with this dog. It's out of control. And I get frustrated, and I'm sure the dog is too, because, hey, the dog wants to do these activities, and this person isn't you know, able to fulfill those. So be realistic. Hey, you know, if you're older and you don't walk so much and you don't want a dog jumping on you, you don't want a dog jumping on the grandkids, get an appropriate size dog that you can handle. Yeah, appropriate size and energy level. Absolutely, yes. Um, We recently also just helped someone acquire a Springer Spaniel, which is technically a high-energy hunting dog, um, but they're seniors, and we helped them acquire a Senior Springer through the Springers for Seniors program. Right. Um, which is a fabulous program. These dogs are older. They need homes. They've, you know, either become displaced or something due to different different reasons. And it's a great opportunity to have a dog that matches your skill level and lifestyle. Absolutely. That, that's a great. That's a great combination. They actually, there's another rescue group kind of by us. It's called Seniors for Seniors, which I think is super cool because it's a it's a good fit. You know, a lot of these dogs and the people have the same energy level. Now I don't say that across the board. Now some seniors I know are more physically fit than me. But. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I mean, if you've had American Bulldogs for 75 years and you've grown and aged and you still continue to have them, that's totally different than someone who's maybe never had a dog before going out and getting. A power breed like a Rottweiler at the age right. of sixty-five or something, or a German Shepherd or anything, anything big and strong and powerful. Um, all right, so let's see here. Hold on one moment. We're gonna have to take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsors, and then we will be right back. Hi. 
Hi everybody and thanks for coming to check out The Best Dog Leash. I am the creator of The Best Dog Leash. I own and run a dog behavior rehab center and I wanted to create a leash that was awesome for my clients and also great for me. Um, this fits any size dog, uh, small enough to fit you know, a little bitty bitty chihuahua, um, but big enough to fit a mastiff. When you're putting this on your dog, you just slip it right over their head. And the very key to this is to making sure that it's as high and tight as possible. You almost want it to be to the corner of their lips. And then with this little tab here, you push down to make it nice and tight so it won't move. That way when you're out walking and your dog goes to pull something or smell something, um, it, the leash and the collar won't move. It'll, it'll keep its place right here on the neck. And then to get it off is also really easy. You just pull the tab up, release it, and it slips right over their neck, like so. I know that sometimes dogs potty on their leashes, or they'll drag it through the mud, and it gets really hard to clean, and then the leash will smell. Um, so this is really nice, because it's super easy to clean, and it doesn't absorb any of that either. And this leash wicks away smell, water, and snow, and it's made out of biothane. Biothane was originally created for horses and horse equipment, so it has the durability and the strength for horses, so obviously it will be great for any size dog, big or small, Great Dane to Chihuahua. This leash is meant to last the lifetime of your dog. To purchase the best dog leash, go to thebestdogleash.com. We also want to see pictures of your dogs wearing the best dog leash. So follow us on Facebook and Instagram and send us pictures of your dog wearing the best dog leash visit us at thebestdogleash.com. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> Scooby, you're not helping. And we're back. Okay, let's jump back into it. All right, so let's talk about getting the right dog, the right breed. All right, so now that we've kind of, you know, divulged our lifestyle, everything that we can and can provide for the dog, let's talk about where we're going to go to get this dog from. I want an Airedale Terrier. <laughs> Oh, you do? Yep. <laughs> I happen to know a couple people. All right. <laughs> well, you know, there's a couple different places we can get dogs from. Obviously, you guys know that you can go to a reputable breeder, and we're going to talk about what is a reputable breeder, okay? Um, then we're going to talk about rescues. Rescues is another option, and we're going to kind of throw in the humane societies in there, too. Yeah, and there's both good and bad rescues. Right, and we're going to talk about both the good and the bad, and if you decide to go the rescue route or the breeder route, because there's good and bad in both of that too, what to look for specifically. I think the first thing we're going to do, though, is jump into what to completely avoid when looking for a puppy, and it's something we call backyard breeders. These are people who have acquired dogs from unreputable breeders to create crosses, mixes, or just really ugly versions of purebred dogs. Yeah, something we always say is purebred doesn't mean well-bred. Absolutely. Just because a dog has AKC or UKC or CKC papers doesn't necessarily mean that the breeder, breeder is doing ethical things, right? Adam? Yeah, because these companies, they're pedigree registration companies. They keep track of lineages, but they'll register puppies from anyone, so... There's so many people out there that it's near impossible for them to manage and track and make sure everyone is um, doing things ethically like they wish they would be. They provide the outlet. You know, they let you enter shows and they provide titling opportunities and they try to educate people on health testing and stuff like that. But even within breed clubs, as hard as we try there usually ends up to be a bad apple in the bunch. Right. Um, and some breeds have done better at keeping their breed more well-protected, and these are probably lesser-known, less popular dogs. But the dogs that become more popular suffer from this at a at a higher rate. I mean, I, have, I guess I have a really good personal experience story to share. I grew up showing Bernie's Mountain Dogs with my mom, um, I actually just received my 25-year club pin member. So I've been, I've been involved in dogs for over 25 years, which is crazy for me to think about. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard, or maybe even some of you have, or know someone that has, a, a Burner Doodle. So Burner Doodle is a Bernese Mountain Dog cross with a poodle, or sometimes a Labrador, or whatever kind of doodle they can make. 
Now, this person that acquired the dog to breed the burner part of the burner doodle did not acquire a dog from a reputable breeder or was very dishonest with a reputable breeder on what they were going to do with a dog. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the thing about it is when you get these doodles or these mixes or these kind of, we call them designer breeds, um, they're not coming from high quality dogs. They're coming from dogs that are not the best. Maybe not health tested, maybe not registered, and none of the puppies, no, no doodle or cross or kind of multi-poo or cat or like a cavapoo or a, there's so many, or teddy bear, there's so many kind of fancy mixed breed dogs that are out there that are for sale. And, and the thing is, they're oftentimes more expensive than a purebred dog. I know, I know a burner doodle uh, woman who's selling them for $15,000 for a puppy. For a for a mutt for, for a, a mixed mix breed dog. Breed dog. Now, now don't now don't get me wrong. They're incredibly adorable, and I see why people are attracted to them. But it's really upsetting to me when people don't do the work, don't do the health testing, don't take care of the dogs where they should be taken care of, and then an owner gets a dog. They spend all this money on the dog. They come to us because spend, the dog has terrible behavior, or they spend all this money on training. Yeah. And now they've invested, let's say, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars into this dog. They get cancer in two years and croak. It's yeah. not fair. Or become genetically crippled because they have bad elbows, shoulders, hips. All things we've seen many, many times. And that's not to say I mean, we have plenty of doodle clients that we love, we love the families, we love the people, but the breeders of these dogs, they're not in it for the dogs they're not it, no it, matter uh, what they tell you no matter what their website looks like they're in it for the pocketbook um because people who were truly doing dogs the right way don't make money on dogs so here's actually kind of fun interesting fact about the labradoodle doodle kind of thing there's a, a guy that who, who created this um the who, he created the labradoodle Otto, will you, will you uh, move this down? I need to see the... I want to make sure I get the quote right. How Just far say, down? Okay, uh, go up a little bit. Okay, so the guy who made... The guy who created the Labradoodle, he was actually involved in service dog training, and he was trying to make a really nice dog for one of his clients. I remember the story. The client was in Hawaii, I believe. <laughs> yeah, so... He wanted to make this great kind of hybrid dog for his client that could do all these tasks. His but it also was hypoallergenic. Hypoallergenic, exactly, for the, for, the, for the client. The guy's name is Wally Conrun. Look him up online. He said that, now this is a direct quote from the guy who created the doodle. It's his life's biggest regret. He said, I opened a Pandora's box and released a Frankenstein's monster. This is the guy who created the doodle. So, you know, think about that when you're thinking about maybe that's the best dog for your life. You know, the creator of the breed doesn't exactly think the same. Yeah, and there's, there's actually, so people say, oh, I'm going to get a doodle because it's hypoallergenic. But it's really just the luck of the draw. Because it's a mixed genetic, your dog might be hypoallergenic. Or it might not be. Or it might shed as bad as a German Shepherd. I've seen that before, too. Yeah. Yeah, So the only way to guarantee it is to actually buy a purebred, hypoallergenic, non-shedding dog. Right. Like a purebred poodle or a Maltese or any one of another of number of other dogs that has been selectively bred to produce this trait reliably. Right. Then you know what you're getting. I mean, how horrible would it be that, let's say you get a... A labradoodle because your child is allergic to dogs and and the breeder is convinced you wholeheartedly that the dogs don't shed and you bring the dog home and the dog sheds and you because, shell out eight grand on the dog the family's emotionally invested right they love the dog they think the dog's amazing and then they gotta give the dog away it's just it's not right so we're trying to provide this information for you guys so you can make those choices without having to hopefully encounter as many heartbreaking situations as we see people go through. So we're just here to kind of give you our experience with our clients and what we've seen people go through. Um, so you guys don't have to go through the same kind of difficulties. Yeah. So then from there, now we kind of have some ideas on um, what's, what's a good breeder, what's maybe... No, no. We've only talked about backyard breeders. We're talking about what to avoid right now. Yeah. So we want to talk about the puppy brokers now. P- 
puppy brokers. So, puppy brokers or pet stores, maybe. Yeah. Um, Petland, I think, is one where you can actually get financing on a puppy. Yeah. And you may get a purebred puppy there or a doodle puppy. I think I recently saw a Roddy Poo. Yeah, that was ridiculous. Um, which, who knows how that thing's going to end up. Right. But, um, puppy brokers. So, this is like a, a go-between type person. So, what they do is they shield puppy mills from the buyer. You know, they maybe usually have a sales pitch or a nice website or um, a, lot of money a, a more personable appearance. Right. Um, and then they go to these factory outlets that are mass producing maybe purebred dogs or maybe doodles. And they can get you what you want. Immediately. Right Probably with financing. <laughs> Probably with financing, too. Which is a big thing, because, you know, especially in the era that we're in, everybody wants something right now, and they want to be able to afford it right now. Um, I'll tell kind of a funny story about a client that we had come in. Um, they had gotten a doodle from a puppy broker, and um, I was at the front desk when the person was checking It's in. a double doodle. Oh, it's a double doodle. I don't, I don't even know what that means exactly, but it's a double doodle. So this person's at the front desk checking in. The guy walks in with the dog. And it looks like a Britney Spaniel. And I, w- I looked at the schedule and I looked at the dog and I was like, hmm, I wonder if he is at the wrong place. Because we have a vet that's close to us and sometimes people come over. And anyway, I got talking to him and no, sure enough, he was there for his lesson. And this was the double doodle. That was actually a Britney Spaniel. Some type of spaniel mix. Something. But definitely not a doodle. No, no. And, and he full-heartedly believed that that's what it was because that's, that's what this puppy broker had told him. So, I mean, there's no way to go back and check genetics to see the parents. And it's like they had become so invested. They, As you guys know, especially anyone that's been a client of ours, training is not cheap. It's not a cheap thing. And it's like, why would you invest so much in training and love and like Otto said emotional connection and then come to find out you know a year and a half or something that something is severely wrong with the dog because we don't know what's going to happen because we don't know the genetics of the dog yeah that's that's very important lineage um you know good breeders are out there doing genetic health testing i know with our own personal breed we have a handful of tests that we run um Aside from putting working and sport titles on the dogs to prove temperament, um, but we want to make sure that the dogs aren't going to pass anything hereditarily down to their offspring. Right. So, well, on that note, let's, let's talk about good breeders. Let's talk about what good breeders do. Let's talk about how to find a good breeder. Yeah. And this is why, even though the cost of a, of a well-bred, purpose-bred, purebred dog might seem high, in comparison to what people are charging for some dogs, um, but why it's so important and why we can say that good breeders don't make any money on dogs is because it's all invested back into the dog. Yeah, I'm sure if you guys ever heard the term, I've, I've seen this go around uh, social media, greeter breeder, as if they were in it for the money. You know, the, there's some people that aren't able to differentiate the people who are pres- preservation breeders and the ones that are backyard breeders. So it's really important to understand the difference. Preservation breeders, and these are the reputable ones that we're talking about that want the best for their breed, that want their lineage of the dogs to continue on, um, are doing the health testing, are doing the work, are titling their dogs. Um, so they're making sure that this breed continues on many more years and then many other generations. Yeah, and the whole purpose is because they love the breed, they want to see the breed continue um, for for their kids and their grandkids and their grandkids' grandkids. Um, and they do things like genetic health testing, like temperament um, proofing. And you want to look for somebody who's breeding a reasonable number of litters that doesn't have, you know, 10, 20 litters a year. You want to look for somebody who's putting sport and working titles on their dogs. And you want to look for somebody who's doing the genetic health testing. It's a breed that, you know that's appropriate for. You're right. Anyway, little, you know, our little toy dogs aren't going to be getting Toy dogs don't titles. get sport dog titles, <laughs> but there's still genetic health testing and it's right. fun stuff that they can do to prove um, that they're producing a genetically stable um, reproduction. So, I mean, so where do you go to find these kind of wonderful people who are involved with, you know, breeding dogs? 
Um, let's say you're really looking for a great hunting Labrador Retriever. I would go and find a hunt trial that was going on near my house, and I would go there, and I would talk to people, and I would see the dogs that I like, and I would, you know, get information on them. If I was looking for a really good, let's say, family companion, um, let's say a little Chinese Crested, I would go to a dog show. I would find a breeder. I, or you, you can actually buy a book at the dog show, and they have all the information in the book, and then it'll tell you, hey, this dog was handled by this person. Right, and bred by this person. And you can start asking questions. You know, how many, um, you know, would you have anything available? What, what kind of health issues are the, is the breed known for? Do you test for those health issues? Can I see a copy of the certificate for those health testings? That's a big thing, too, because you don't want to just take people's word for it. You want to see proof. And good breeders who are doing the work have absolutely no problem coughing up the, the, the paperwork. Right. They should also allow you to meet the parents of the dog or at least show you a plethora of um, proof of the way the parents act, um, you know, in public, in the home, around people. Right. Um, because if you go to select a puppy and they won't let you see the parents or interact with the parents, that's a giant red flag right there. But I will, th- I will say there's a couple exceptions to that, though. You know, sometimes, like, for example, I own a dog who is bred off a 15-year-old semen. So, obviously, the dog isn't alive anymore. Right. Or sometimes, too, a breeder will bring in semen from overseas or from, you know, some way half across the country. So, you're not necessarily going to be able to... But we can still go dog. back in records and look at yeah, flyers. Absolutely. Look at flyers' records. You, you know, he's a right. proven show dog. His hips were x-rayed. His elbows were x-rayed. He was genetically DNA tested to show that um, he was free from ataxia and different diseases and disorders. Right. So don't don't let it completely deter you if, if you can't see one parent or the other. Um, also, some breeds and some breeders are more particular, too, about you being around the puppies and around the mother. Some mothers have become very protective of their puppies, depending on the breed. Um, you know, so on that note, we're going to take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back talking about mothers and their puppies. You love your dog, right? It's important while you're at work, your pup isn't sitting home bored all day. Your dog needs necessary physical and mental activity to be fulfilled. And let's face it, the same walk around the block with the dog walker is boring. How many times can you sniff the same bush? It's time to enroll your pup in Daily Balance. Daily Balance is a program revolutionized by you and your dog that provides daily fulfillment for your dog. We promote good behaviors like waiting at the door, walking nicely on a leash, greeting strangers politely, behaving nicely in public, and of course, lots of playtime. We specifically select your dog's friends to ensure positive social interactions. We found a lot of our clients were struggling with their dog's behavior when they went to doggy daycare. Their pups were learning humping behavior, poop eating behavior. Their dogs were getting picked on and beat up by other hounds and receiving bad report cards and being put in time out. Then, by trying to avoid the bad behaviors at doggy daycare, owners were taking their pup to the dog park. At the dog park, pups were picking up diseases from other unvaccinated pets. Occasionally, their dogs were getting bit or bothered by other hounds, all while their owners were paying no attention to their naughty dog walking around on their iPhones. At Daily Balance, we provide activities for your dog throughout the day by doing obedience, working on individual training, playing in small groups, going on field trips, and playing around in the city. We do all our activities in public to practice good behaviors in many different environments. We have birthday parties. We teach new tricks. We work on canine fitness. We go on individual and group walks. We go backpacking. And we have special events like scent work training, agility days, and pool parties. We give your dog the fulfillment that they are begging for every day. We are your Monday through Friday 9 to 5 dog concierge service. Need your dog to go to and from the vet, groomer, or boarding facility? That service is included in our weekly unlimited package. Want to see what a day in the life of your dog looks like at Daily Balance? Make sure to watch our video, Day in the Life of My Dog, at Daily Balance. We can't wait to meet and work with you and your dog and give them the daily fulfillment that they desire and need, all while making your life easier. It's time to give your dog their own life, their own friends, and their own schedule of events. 
And we're back with mothers being protective of their puppies, and if that's more prevalent in certain breeds. And it definitely is. I definitely think that some of the more high-power breeds are going to be more prone to being protective of their puppies. And then sometimes there's like there's just, you know, different dogs too. Well, that. I'll tell you what. When we went to Costa Rica to select the kind of Corso puppies, and uh, she let those two parents of them out in the room with us without having ever introduced them to us before. I was very aware of their presence. <laughs> right, yeah. Thank God they were friendly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but there was a few seconds of, uh, my Spanish isn't that great. <laughs> they were big dogs, too. Real big dogs. So, you know, don't be completely turned off, too, if, you know, um, you can't see the puppies right away, too. Also, when the puppies are really little, they're known to contract a virus called parvo. Which is absolutely deadly. It's deadly to the puppies. It can take out the entire litter. And it, these litters are years and years and years and lifetime of these breeders' work. So they're obviously going to be a little bit protective. So if you know of a breeder that has a litter and you're interested, don't be totally turned off if they're not going to let you come see the puppies right away. Or if they have a special protocol in order for you to see or touch the puppies, like, you know, washing your hands. Wearing yeah, your sterilizing your shoes. Yep, taking your shoes off all together. You know, there's going to be things that they're going to do to protect the puppies and their health. Um, so let's, okay, here's, here's another good question, Otto. Let's say that you really want this Airedale puppy. Are you going to get to pick the dog that you want out of the litter? Some breeders are going to let you pick the dog that you want out of the, the litter, depending on your experience level. Some breeders are not going to let you pick the dog out of the litter because they know how to properly pair each puppy with its prospective home. Right, exactly. There's there's certain there's certain breeders too that if there's only two dogs in the litter and, and they're going to keep one, well, you're going to get the other one. Or sometimes if they have a singleton, you may not get one at all. Um, the breeders generally know and understand their puppies and their lineage really well, and they're they're going to know what dog is going to serve best for your family and your circumstance. A lot of times, um, you know, pet people come in and they're like, "I like this one because I love the markings on his feet or his face." And they may not, that might not be the appropriate dog for them, especially if they have kids and the dog is more quiet and reserved and not so outgoing. Right. Um, or if it's just downright fearful. Or if someone's looking for a sport dog and the temperament just isn't going to suit the purpose. Right. We really have to take the looks as much as possible kind of out of the determining factor of what dog I'm going to pick. Because no matter what, they're going to be cute. I mean, I mean does anybody really loves ugly, puppies. Yeah, does anybody really have an ugly dog? I don't think so. Well, maybe some. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Um, let's see here. What happens if a breeder puts you on a wait list? Should you wait or should you go find somebody where you can get a puppy from right away? Um, I always say the best things come to those who wait. Yeah. You I know, agree. Um, if you've tracked down a responsible breeder and you know they have credibility and they've put in the work and you see proof of it, that and you see titles and you see they only have a litter every year or two and you see they've done the genetic health testing and you can get put on a waiting list i would do it absolutely i would much rather be put on a waiting list for a dog than let's say well i want a bernie's mountain dog right now and i'm going to go find somebody that has a litter that has puppies available because i can tell you right now a really good breeder isn't going to have a puppy for you right now this is something that they've been planning and working on and advertising for for the last, you know, two years. I can tell you right now, Otto and I have breedings planned. For the next five years. Yeah, five, even maybe even ten years from now. And it's like we have people that already want puppies that aren't even happening yet, you know. So people who do good work, you're going to have to wait a little bit for it. And I, I highly suggest that you wait for it. I mean, think about it. A dog is a 10 to sometimes 15 year commitment. Waiting, a, you know, six to seven to maybe a year. Sometimes people wait a year and a half. For the right dog, is going to be way worth it. Way worth it. And if you get antsy and you don't want to wait, um, you know, things can go terribly wrong. We've seen, I mean, we've seen it happen at work. We've seen people that have wanted a dog right now. They are, you know, they're... Their kids are, you know, young, and they want a young dog to raise the kids with, and they don't want to wait another year, and they go out and they get a dog, and it turns into a disaster. And we right. see and this, like, over and over and Now over they're again. investing money in surgery to correct health problems. Right. It's, and it's, it's, it's a stinky problem. It's not fair. It's not fair for the dog. It's not fair for you. So be patient. You know, 
a lot of things now in this day and age are quick and, you know, uh, get it now and Amazon ships things in two days and, you know, dogs are not like that. You're not just going to pull up a website and find the dog and you're going to go get it. That's not how it works. So what if I don't want to buy a pure purpose-bred dog? What if something speaks to my soul and I have to rescue one? I mean, I've been there. Have you? I have rescue dogs and I've owned rescue dogs. Um throughout my life, but um, I usually acquired them not maybe from a specific rescue, but from a client that just couldn't commit to that dog's particular needs and requirements. Yeah, me too. Or something that we frequently get is emails or messages from people who have, hey, this particular dog is at animal control or it's at the Humane Society. and No one else can handle it but you, so please take them. Right. And we get those messages... I feel like daily almost. Yeah. It's crazy. And we can't, it, it, the har- most heartbreaking thing for me is we can't say yes to everybody, but every once in a while, one slips through the cracks, right, Otto? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, I got a couple of them. <laughs> so, if I'm going to go out and rescue a puppy, aren't all rescues good? Uh, no, they're not. Definitely not. So, so. what are we going to look for? Um, we needed to. We need to look for a rescue that's making quality placements. We need to look for a rescue that doesn't lie to its rescuers. Um, we need to look for a rescue that's committed to the health and behavior of the dogs that they place. Right, I agree. I think where they get the dogs from too is really important to understand. Yeah, because all of a sudden, some rescues have magic litter of puppies all the time. Every. Four to six weeks. That's pretty crazy. Just boxes and boxes of puppies mysteriously from the south. Right. It's pretty odd, if you ask me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's say you want to go the rescue route. I certainly have made that choice before. Um, my favorite dog that I've ever owned in my entire life was a rescue dog. Um, and I don't ever regret him being my dog. So rescue is definitely an option. If that's something that you want to do, there's certain things you need to consider when you do this, like Otto was saying. Um, the biggest, number one thing, you ready for this? Do not get a puppy that has been pediatrically spayed or neutered. It's a recipe for disaster. We've seen it. Not just one, not just ten, not even just a hundred times. But I would be willing to say in the last 20 years, I've seen it thousands of times. At least, at least. And, that, and that's not even an exaggeration of puppies that are neutered. Let's just say like under eight months before puberty. Hits. And it's, it's like the sleeping giant. You right. can't really see this problem always developing until puberty age. And then the dogs lack the hormones necessary to go through puberty. Dogs that are spayed and neutered pediatrically, and, and I'll say, and, and I'm going to include pediatric and any dog that hasn't gone through like a heat cycle, or any male dog that hasn't developed full testicles yet. Um, this is what we would consider a pediatric yeah. spay or neuter. And just to make it really clear, too, neutering is for dogs and spaying is for females. Yeah. Okay. So. I'm sorry, neutering is for neutering is for male dogs and spaying is for female dogs. Because sometimes people come in and they say, oh, my male's been spayed. I'm like, oh, wow. That's interesting. <laughs> How'd that happen? I don't know how that one happened. So just so you guys know. Um, all right, so why should we not get a puppy that's been pediatrically spayed or neutered? So this can cause incredible temperament flaws. Um, we've seen it time and time again. As their puppy age, everything seems fine and normal, but the reproductive organs affect the endocrine system, which um, can largely affect mood and temperament. So the male dogs typically become hyper, insecure, aggressive, and the female dogs typically have a problem bonding with other living creatures. True. Like other dogs. Sometimes even I feel like the... Children in the family. Children in the family, right. They can be kind of snappy towards them too. There's a bunch of literature too also that backs up kind of our experience. I just want to be really clear too. We're talking about our experience of the thousands and thousands of dogs that we've been working with 
for the last 20 plus years. So this is all just stuff that we, we witness, we experience, we deal with. This isn't ideas that we've collected from other people. This isn't from science-based research, from anything like that. This is just our personal experience and what we've seen and we're trying to help educate people so they don't get stuck in some of these really bad situations that other people have been in. Now, after we've noticed this correlation, there are new veterinary studies that agree with us. Right. We'll um, share some of those with you guys, we'll, too. We'll throw them up on the screen. You know, you'll be able to see them. You'll, we'll throw some resources up there. Um, you know, and you can, you can do some research and make up your own mind from there. Right. Um, so, please... Please, 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 whatever you do, if you decide to go the rescue route, do not get a puppy that has been pediatrically spayed or neutered. It will save you a world of headache. Now, don't get me wrong. There's some that are okay, because I'm sure somebody's going to type, well, my dog was spayed. spayed at six weeks old, hey, and he's right. just fine. Right. Yeah. Okay, you're the exception. All right. right. That's not how it goes. You're, it's an outlier, okay? So, um, actually, the veterinarian I used to work for disagreed with it so much that he started doing dog vasectomies because he believed the dogs should be hormonally intact. Yeah, and I think that's a really good option, too, for male dogs. Especially if you can find a vet that's aware of this new procedure and that's willing to do it. That's something I would totally, totally... uh, Then they can remain hormonally intact, but they can't reproduce, which still gives the end result that the rescues and the veterinarians are looking for, which is population control. So let's talk to about um, rescues and kind of some of their processes and trying, you know, you guys trying to get a dog from them. Um, if any of you guys have gone down this road, you might have experienced some of this stuff before, but a lot of times they'll want to come to your house, they'll want to do a home visit, they'll call your vet, they'll want your vet records to make sure that you've taken good care of your dogs. They may even want to meet your other dogs. Yeah, they may want to meet your other dogs too. And you have to ask yourself, how invasive do I want to allow these people who I don't know um, to come into my house and to judge and evaluate how I live. You know, that's something that you have to ask yourself because that's something you have to be prepared for because a lot of rescues will do that. Or if you don't have a fenced-in backyard, um, it might be a problem for them. So just be aware that those are some of the things that you might run into when um, going to a rescue. So we're going to take another quick break to hear a final word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back um, kind of wrapping things up, talking about, you know, other red flags maybe from rescues and, um, you know, kind of connecting all the dots of this conversation. And we're back. So I'm looking at this rescue dog and uh, I've been told he's had a very traumatic past and he's a very powerful breed and he may have had a bite history, but look how cute he is. Let's talk about that. Okay, so rescue groups have been known to write really compelling, beautiful stories about the dog. Look for, look for verbiage, guys. Look for, I want to be the apple of your eye, or I want to be the only one that you can love on. That means the dog is probably dog aggressive and does not like other dogs and maybe has gone after other dogs, but the rescue will not admit that advertly to you. There's even been cases, um, I think that are pretty easy to find, and we'll throw some of them up here, where rescues have flat-out lied to people and adopted out dangerous dogs, and the dog's gone on to severely injure or maim or kill someone. That's true. Yeah, it, it has happened. It definitely yeah. has happened. We've, we've seen it before. We've worked with these clients before. Right. I, I And also, too, this is something else that's really important. If you guys go the rescue route or go, you get a dog from the Humane Society or Animal Control... Take the dog to the vet immediately after getting the dog from them. I'm going to share a personal story for myself. I acquired a dog. I was looking for a kind of low-key, mellow kind of guy. Um, went to I went to rescue. I found a dog that fit all of my check boxes. I was looking for a calm, kind of laid-back kind of guy. I wanted a pit bull kind of mix. Boom, found him. So I go there, get him, bring him home. He's really quiet, almost too quiet. I take him outside, and he collapses in the front yard. I lift up his little gums, and, and I push on him, and he's got almost no refill, which means that he's got some, some got some issues going on. I took him to the vet and found out that he was totally filled with heartworms. And I had just gotten this dog from the rescue, who, who had, and they had told me, oh, he's healthy, he's fine, he doesn't have heartworms, here's all of his paperwork. 
you know, had I not been proactive and taken him to the vet, the dog would have died. On the next America's Top Dog, for the first time, two underdogs take on the canines. Meet Moto huh? and Wolverine. Nice! There he goes, <laughs> into the water. They'll face Fuse, an explosive detection dog seen on live PD. Huh? Riddick, an expert in tracking and narcotics. Good boy. And Mattis, a Purple Heart recipient. Go. Come on! Oh. Who will be America's Top Dog? And yeah. his heartworm treatment was insanely expensive and really hard on him. And yeah. he almost died twice. Yeah, incredibly painful treatment. It's not fun. So take your dog, if you get one from a rescue or from the Humane Society, regardless of what they tell you, regardless... Yeah. Even if they have a staff veterinarian. Right. Regardless of what the paperwork says, take it to your vet and know what's going on with your Which dog. Which throws us back to another responsible breeder, Q. Every responsible breeder I've ever known requires you to take your dog to a third-party veterinarian within 72 hours of delivery so they can prove what they say is accurate by a person who doesn't even know them. Right, absolutely. So, you know, it's just a good idea to know what you have. And then if you, if, if you have acquired a dog that does have some sort of health issues or massive problem, you know, right away, you can take the dog back if you need to. Um, and Most we, people aren't going to do this because they're already emotionally invested, right. which is why we should have done our homework in the, the first place. place. Absolutely. So there's definitely, you know, some trials and tributes uh, dealing with rescues. But, you know, I will say this. There's some really good ones out there. There's some good ones out there. There's some people who are really doing the right thing, who are placing dogs with people who are, they know are going to give the dog a good genetically fulfilled life. Yeah. Um, we'll provide some resources for you guys too. On yeah, we'll throw them up here on the screen. Rescues that we like um, and rescues. We're not going to obviously post rescues that we don't like. You guys have to do your due diligence because we're not here to talk. <laughs> yeah, we're people. not going <laughs> to trash anyone. Yeah. Um, that's not the purpose of this podcast. There's probably one out there that'll do it though. Um, okay, also too, just a quick thing. If you have kids or if you have grandkids, I do not recommend going the rescue route because you do not know what you're going to get as far as behavior or temperament. Or is. health. Or health. And then your kids love the dog, and then it drops dead in six months. Yeah, you don't don't do it. Don't do it. I've, we've seen too many people have just had nightmare experiences, or or you know, the kids get knocked over, and the dog bites them. We've had a kid get bitten in the face and had extensive, extensive plastic surgery within seventy two hours of getting the dog. Yeah. So, and a lot of times these people that are involved in rescue, they're they're dog lovers. They're dog lovers. They're, they're not necessarily very knowledgeable on reading behavior or understanding what a dog is really capable of doing. And you always have to remember a dog is a liability. But Karen's volunteered for HSUS for 15 years and she walks dogs on her lunch break. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. It does not make her a behavior expert. It does not make her a know-all of pit bulls because I'm sure that's what she, all she sees all the time. Yeah, you especially know? if it's a city HSUS. Yeah. So if you're going, if you have kids or if you have grandkids uh, frequently, please, please, please make sure you are getting a dog from a reputable breeder with something that we highly suggest. Yeah, and something that absolutely fits your lifestyle and needs. Right. You know, if you need a dog to be social and reliable and not high drive or crazy, you know, make sure you pick a dog whose genetic tendencies are to be calm and loving towards small children. Um, if you pick out a couple breeds that you think you are attracted to, buy books on them. Read a couple different authors' viewpoints on this breed and learn about the history. Frequently, I meet people who have a dog who've acquired a purebred dog through rescue or through a breeder, and they have no idea what the dog was genetically designed to do. Right, and then they come to us because they're having massive behavioral issues because their border collie is chasing their kids around the house and nipping at their feet and they're confused and they don't understand why and they're like why is this dog like this so you know save yourself a couple headaches yeah do the homework first you know create a plan of action and then follow through and talk to the breeders call them on the phone most of these breeders that breed these preservation breeders that i speak of they are more than happy to sit on the phone and talk to you forever about their dogs, yeah. their lineage, their work. It's because their they've been work. doing it for 60 years and it's, you know, their favorite thing to talk about. Right, right. Just like we like talking about dogs. That's why we're here. Yeah, talking dogs. <laughs> I mean, how many of you guys have heard me say when you come to pick up your dog, I could sit and talk dogs all day. So now Literally. we can. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's pretty amazing. Um, what's an appropriate 
age to take an infant or juvenile puppy home? Ah, good question. So I would say, and this is just, again, this is my personal experience from what I've witnessed people getting dogs from different ages. I would say 9 to 12 weeks is a really good age to get a puppy. Right, because there's some very important life lessons that they need to learn from their litter mates. Absolutely. Stuff like mouth inhibition um, and social ranking. Right, absolutely. That's all really, really important. And we see those dogs who are taken away from a litter too early, let's say four, five, six weeks. They have really awkward play styles. Yeah. They want to snap. They want yeah. to Unless up. you're an expert at raising puppies, it's, it's just throwing another cog in the works to to create problems and an expert at raising puppies doesn't mean that you raised two lab puppies when you were a kid right (laughs) (laughs) we've also heard this too well i've had dogs before and i've never had this problem this dog isn't the dog you had before right and this isn't what you do for a living so remember your skill level remember what you can and can't handle and be really honest with yourself about what you can and can't commit to and what you're really looking for in a dog the worst thing you can do is go, oh my gosh, I've fallen in love with how he looks. He's the perfect one for me. That's when all the problems start, and that's when the expenses right. start. Or I was at the rescue, and he was in the back of his kennel, and he just looked so sad and scared. And they had told me that he'd been there for over two years. Okay, there's a reason he's been there for over two years. And there's a reason that he looks sad and scared. And it's probably not the story that you were told. A lot of times, they will apply this story to use emotional hijacking to get the dog out the door. Because some places are only concerned with the number of dogs they turn over and not actually concerned about your family or the dog's well-being. Right. Once the dog's yours, it's yours. We've had a bunch of clients, too, that have come to us, too, where the dog is bitten a family member or, you know, gone after another family dog, and they're like, we can't keep this dog. And they go back to the rescue, and, and the, the rescue. rescue's like, ah. sorry, not our problem. Whereas a reputable breeder will take the dog back if it's 12 years old and you need to get rid of it for whatever reason. Yeah. Even the dogs that Otto and I place, every once in a while, every once in a while Otto and I have adult dogs that are available um, that are fully trained, and... These dogs, I don't care if the dog is 12, 14, 15, 16 years old. I don't care if it's on its deathbed. If it needs me, it needs me. When I have a dog that becomes my dog for whatever reason, I'm committed to the dog for his life. Now, if there's a particular reason, like let's say you adopt a dog and they tell you, hey, you adopted this dog, now it's your problem and you know we're not going to help you. That's not right. That's not a rescue you want to be working with. Sometimes, sometimes you don't get the right dogs. There's going to be times where... You, We've seen, I think, people maybe mismastered the dog and the owner doesn't match, right? So right. What would you do in that situation if you feel like you got a puppy that wasn't the right fit for you? So you should contact the rescuer or the breeder and talk about a different selection. Absolutely. And not feel bad if the breeder or the rescue is, well, you pick this dog and it's your problem and now, you know, whatever, you know, they don't want to work with you. You're not working with the right people, you know. Yeah. People that are really in it for the dogs are in it for the dogs and they're going to help. Yep. So, anything you want to touch on in closing? Yeah, let's talk about some of the breeds that we would suggest maybe for different lifestyles or activity levels. Yeah. Um, let's talk about, um, I, I think your suggestion was really good about, um, people who are maybe the retired age, who are maybe less active, working with uh, rescue groups or looking or talking to a breeder because sometimes breeders have older do- have older dogs that are available. Yeah, especially like a retired show dog. Right. Those sometimes can be available for people. And, um, you know, finding the right dog that fits your life um, is really, really important. Yeah. Um, if you're a marathon runner, don't get an English bulldog. Right. You know, unless you expect them to sit at home and wait for you to run the marathon. <laughs> You know, don't get a mastiff maybe right that's gonna be big and slime and make a mess and it may be a yippy dog that is gonna bug bark and bother your neighbors yeah. yeah you know like a shelfie for example they're very vocal dogs that's how you know they move some of their stock i'm always amazed when people are like he barks all the time and i'm like well it's kind was, of his genetics he was supposed to he that's how he works that's how he does his job so you know don't be surprised when dogs 
exhibit things that maybe aren't a good fit for your lifestyle if you haven't done the homework. Do the homework. Talk to the breeders. Talk to the rescue people. Talk to people who've gotten dogs from breeders and rescues too to kind of see what their experience has been like and what kind of dog they ended up with. Yeah. All good stuff. Um, just trying to think anything here before we say goodbye to the nice people who came to listen to us. So, if and when you decide to get your puppy, we're going to kind of recover things we went through. Get a dog. If you want one from a breeder, get one from a reputable breeder. We, we talked about things to look for as far as, you know, health testing, um, titling, you know, seeing what the parents have produced before, talking to people who've gotten dogs from the breeders before. And if you're going to get one from a rescue, make sure you've talked to the rescue. Make sure that they're an appropriate group of people that you want to work with. Talk to people who've gotten dogs from the rescue to see how their communication has been after they've, you know, adopted the dog from them. Also, if you're going to go for, if you're like, hey, screw it. You know what? I just really want this super cute Merle Burner Doodle. He's adorable. I don't care what these people say. Just know that you have to have the finances prepared for health, for training. Oh, that was something that we forgot to talk about in the meat and potatoes of this conversation. Odd colors. Yeah, odd colors. That's a huge red flag. Huge red flag. If somebody is selling you a Merle Pitbull. Or a blue Labrador. Or a silver Lab. You guys, that doesn't exist. Look at the breed standards. If you go to AKC or UKC, it will show you colors that are acceptable colors that are historically accurate. Right. Um, A Merle Labrador, not okay. Yeah. And Merle's cropping up in more and more breeds, and people are mixing this genetic into those breeds to get the color to sell it at a higher price. Because it looks really cool, right? Well, you know what? Those recessive traits are also tied to health problems. And sometimes behavioral issues, yeah. Exactly. You don't want that. Don't set yourself up for for heartache. Um, So don't don't do that, you know. Again, we just want to say that all this stuff is, all of our information, everything that we're sharing is just our personal life experience from all the clients and all the dogs that we've dealt with. And we're trying to set people up for success because we want you guys to have a really, really awesome life with your dog. I mean, you have the dog for 10 to 15 years of your life. We want you to have a really cool dog that that can do everything that you could possibly dream of and want. Um, So, Yeah. Um, Make sure you follow us on Instagram at You and Your Dog LLC. Make sure you check us out and follow us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash You and Your Dog LLC. And we want to thank everybody for coming to listen to us. And we want to say shop or adopt responsibly. Absolutely. Okay, and if and when you acquire your puppy, make sure to reach out to us for training. We have a great puppy jumpstart program where we set you up for success for the first year of your dog's life. It has a ton of stuff built into it, including multiple board and train stays, private lessons, unlimited tech support, and it's just a great program. Yeah, our, all of our puppy raisers, our puppy raiser programs are awesome, and our clients are super, super happy with the program. And, um, yeah, check us out. You may know us from You and Your Dog, Behavioral Health and Dog Training. But we also run International Defense Canine, where we supply distinguished clients with protection dogs all over the world. In these uncertain times, everyone wants to make sure that their homes and families are protected. 
It's a fact reported by the Department of Justice that homes with dogs are as much as 80% less likely to be burglarized than homes without dogs. But an untrained dog is far less likely to follow through if the unthinkable was to actually happen. A properly selected and trained dog will lay its life on the line for you, ensuring your safety by allowing you to make an escape or mount a formidable defense by retrieving a weapon. But a gun could be taken from you and used against you and your family. Once you add a properly bred, selected, and trained dog to your family, it could never be tricked or used against you. It would rather sacrifice itself than see you be harmed. We have the most diverse selection of dog breeds. We provide the safest, most well-balanced protection dogs on the planet, and we would never pigeonhole a client into a breed they didn't want or that their wife and kids couldn't handle. People often ask us, what does a protection dog do? Well, a protection dog is just like any other pet dog, except for they're trained to interpret what a threat is. So let's say you're at home and somebody stops by that, you know, is a perceived threat. Your dog will be able to take action and protect your house. It's really important when selecting a dog that we have a nice, well-balanced dog from a great breeder. The genetics of a dog plays a big part in selection and the training process. For me personally, I really like to always have a dog with me, one that's trained for personal protection. I usually keep a dog in my car with me or I take one to work. If I go to the grocery store too, I always have my personal protection dog in the car. The great thing about a dog is a dog can never be used against you. There are many breeds that are able to do this type of work. Uh, selecting a dog from a good breeder is obviously one of the most important parts in having a protection dog that performs the way that you want it to. There's a big misconception that protection dogs are dangerous dogs or that they can't be around kids or, you know, that they might be violent or just randomly attack somebody, but that just isn't the case. With proper training, a dog will be able to protect you, protect your house or your estate or your property, um, and then also be able to be a great family pet. So if you have friends over, your dog can certainly be out and amongst the friends as well. Having the balance is extremely important, and that's where the training comes in. So your dog is able to be that great protection dog and also able to be a great family pet. We provide the education to not only make your dog a loving companion, but a reliable security system and defender. If you are interested in a personal protection dog for yourself, for your family, or for your estate, please feel free to reach us at 262-719-5023. You can call or text us. We are located 30 minutes west of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we look forward to meeting you.